Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I stand at the summit of a very bad Jewish education and a very bad secular education. Uh, I do not have the luxury to indulge myself in a choice of language since I only have one. I've learned French for political reasons and Greek so I could order groceries. But the language of my spirit is English. Mr. Ravitch manifests an interesting nostalgia for Yiddish and Hebrew, but if he believes that the future of Jewish emotion and spirituality resides in those two languages, he must relegate the entire North American Jewish experience to the outer limits. The fact is that Jewish experience, contemporary Jewish experience for the larger number of Jews alive today is English. But it doesn't matter anyhow because Mr. Ravitch is guilty. That's too strong a word. He labors in the error that there is no spiritual content without language. And it is my primary contention that language only obscures spiritual content and is in the second realm of the encounters with divinity or the spirit. Mr. Ravitch is frightened that uh, the entire Jewish experience will degenerate to some obscure sect performing a ghostly ritual. I think uh, if that sect were composed of 36 men, it might be worth the entire religious observance of the diaspora. Um, I also, Mr. Ravitch, although I do not have anything approaching your background in European uh, uh, Judaism, uh, would caution you to speak less casually about the Jewish eternity. Because the Jewish eternity is not in the hands of the practitioners of one language or another, but in higher hands who may choose an entirely different method of communication to reveal his plan. So let us not jump too quickly to involve our destiny in any particular alphabet. I think our destiny transcends an alphabet. I don't think, especially in the Canadian experience, that the writers have disdained the prophetic role. As a matter of fact, they're kind of maniacs about it. I would say that one of the most common features of a Canadian Jewish writer is a messianic complex. Encouraged by the hostility of his readership, and the obscurity of, of his position in the country. But certainly, a writer like Klein, who titles his book The Second Scroll, surely must be counted among someone who has prophetic aspirations. Adele Wiseman's book The Sacrifice, probably the best Canadian novel to come out of this country. The entire structure of it appears to me to be in the prophetic tradition. Pause before the accent. Pardon? Pause before the accent. <laughs> no, no. The idea of a real Jewish writer to me is on the par with those people that discuss which meat stores are really kosher. The important thing is nourishment. The label is secondary. Where are the men of the spirit? If they exist among us and speak with their hands, we owe them our gratitude. The world is hostile not only to the Jewish writer, Miss Wiseman, the world is hostile to the writer, 
The world is hostile to the poet. The world is hostile to any man who will hold up a mirror to the particular kind of mindless chaos in which we endure. That is the glory of the poet. That is the glory of the writer. That is the glory of the Jew, that he is despised, that he moves in this mirrored exile, covered with mirrors. And as he passes through the communities where he sojourns, he reflects their condition and his condition. To me, his destiny is exile, and his vocation is to be despised. In modern times, two groups of human beings have talked identity incessantly and endlessly at the stars, hesitating only to tune their ears to some cosmic reply which is not forthcoming, the Jews and the Canadians. To be a Jewish Canadian is to really stick your neck out. The cosmos does not respond to argument, nor to the greed of comfortable reason. Now, Canadians have turned their country into a continental analyst's couch from which they di dissect their dreams, bandaging their anguish with royal commissions, and all the answers are dull as psychiatry. Deep in that shadow, which is our national heart, we live with the disease, with a very special disease. But we never speak it because we do not wish to cure ourselves. The disease is the knowledge for every and each Canadian that we do not wish to become a nation. We want a flag to stand for us, a picture of a red leaf, a red leaf to soothe us who are so far from the sap of living and the risks of growth. We want literally a standard of living, not national life. We want cities, ballet, poetry, money, forests, but we do not want to own them. We want an abstraction to own them, an abstraction called America, an abstraction called foreign investment, that mess of pottage which economists have made so palatable that no one dares resist it. We do not wish to own ourselves, to accept the dangers of national loneliness, but that is not the disease. The disease is knowing that we do not wish to own ourselves, that we can never, that is the disease we can never articulate. That involves a language of danger and honesty, which is too painful to speak. So we debate the language itself. We inflame ourselves with the fetishes of identity. Now, I take this seriously. Now, the modern Jew is an expert in this particular variety of intellectual orgy. And we can teach this country a great deal about the art of losing itself in symbols and aimless self-examination. We could train Canada for an endless symposium, for we suffer from an ancient and more important version of the same failure of courage. When I speak of myself, I speak of the writer. And the remarks I, I, I'm going to follow with, I apply to the men who articulate the feelings of our community. Judaism is the secretion which an Eastern tribe, with which an Eastern tribe surrounded a divine irritation, a direct confrontation with the absolute. That happened once in history and we still feel the warmth of that confrontation, divorced as we are 
from the terms of it. That happened a long time ago. Today we covet the pearl, but we are unwilling to support the irritation, the burning nucleus, and our spiritual life today has the exact consistency of an unclean oyster, and it stinks to heaven. We cannot face heaven. We have lost our genius for the vertical. Jewish novelists are sociologists, horizontalists, and the residue of energy left from that great vertical seizure we had 4,000 years ago that we turn toward ourselves. We knock on our own doors and wonder that no one answers. We create this insane Talmud of identity that must end in psychiatry or Zionism, but never in a prayer of praise. Perhaps our taste for the absolute was too intense. We could not bear the light. We could not support the annihilation of the world inherent in the light. Perhaps we lost the land because we no longer wished to possess it. The light made the cities and the temples irrelevant. Perhaps we can live every day with the destruction of European Jewry in our hearts because in some unassailable quarter of our psyche we know that the exile had become meaningless, just as our exile in Canada has become meaningless. Now it is not easy for me to say this or to think it, and I accept the censure of those of you who have suffered, which you must direct to one like myself who has not suffered anything but a small spiritual anxiety, and that among comfortable circumstances. But the emptiness of our exile in Canada has driven me into arrogance and scalpel thrusts. There is an awful truth which no Jewish writer investigates today, which no Jewish poet articulates. It is, it is a, a truth that the synagogues and the, and the cultural establishment cannot efface. And it is this truth. We no longer believe we are holy. This is the declaration that I wait to hear going out from synagogues and from the lips of cultural Jews and ethical Jews. This is the confession without which we cannot begin to raise our eyes. The absence of God in our midst and it's interesting that in the two symposia that I've been to in the, within the Jewish community in the past few months, no one has mentioned the word God. And I am laboring under the misapprehension that the Jewish people represents that testimony on the earth. And that without that testimony informing its actions, Jewish survival is nominal and no more important to me than Armenian survival or Greek survival. The absence of God in our midst is a deep, rotten cavity that has killed the nerve of the people. We are ready to accept psychiatric solutions for our suffering. We are ready to accept ethics instead of sanctity, and we will die very badly for our choice. And our monuments will be new parochial schools and the State of Israel and a militant anti-defamation league, and maybe even a Jewish president of the United States. Well, to hell with these mausoleums. The architecture, look at it, of our new city synagogues speaks of their hideous obsession with safety. Now, before we begin, we must face that despair that none of us dares articulate, that we no longer feel we are holy. And our writers will continue to be sociologists and catalogers. There will be no psalms, there will be no light, there will be no illumination until we can confess the position into which we have decayed. Each generation of men must continue the ancient and holy dialogue between the material, secular, artificial, ethnocentric on the one hand, and on the other the spiritual, ascetic, 
natural, experiential. Certainly we have built too much on the other side. The balance has hit the ground. Let us refuse the title Jew to any man who is not obsessed by God. Let that become the sole qualification of Jewish identity. Let us encourage young men to go into the deserts of their heart and burn the praise of perfection. Let us do it with drugs or whips or sex or blasphemy or fasting, but let men begin to feel the perfection of the universe. Let us declare a moratorium on all religious services until someone reports a vision or breaks his mind on the infinite. Jews without God are lilies that fester. Let us discard the mentality of the minion, the danger which it was meant to shield us from, lonely self-annihilation in the spirit, is unfortunately no longer a danger. Let us make it a danger. Let us see Jewish monasteries. Our families are strong enough to support the dialectic. We need our dirty saints and our monstrous hermits. Let us create a tradition for them, for they light the world. And now it's time for the questions to be raised from the floor. I thought that uh, Mr. Cohen had criticized the prophetic traditions in the Jewish writing. And to my amusement and dismay, he proved himself to be a prophet of something else at the end. Uh, therefore, I would like to ask him what his definitions are of uh, God and holy, and how can man nowadays relate to these entities? Look, I, I would not blaspheme the name by giving it a definition at this particular symposium. If your apparatus for comprehending the numinous has collapsed to such a degree where you ask me for a definition of God, then you are beyond my therapy. <laughs> well, then, then for my sake, just define, I'm sorry, for my sake, would you just define the efficacy, the superior spiritual efficacy of whips and drugs and stuff, not God? I would say categorically at this moment that in any junkie's kitchen, there is a greater contact with, this, with the spiritual world than any given synagogue on the North American continent. That's all I mean. I want to remind you that literature is an art. And nobody mentioned that tonight. And life. And art as such is universal. And I think that the problem of identification of the English writer in his identification as a Jew, as a Jewish writer, that problem is a very limited one. Because a writer has to identify only to him, with himself, be honest to himself, and through himself, identify with men in general, with mankind in general. By showing a mirror to men, by showing his bleeding heart in connection with man's faith, through that he becomes the leader of mankind. And it's not important whether he is a Jew, a Jew or non-Jew. And in art, the contents is universalism. Art speaks and has to speak to everyone. And because of what we lived through, what we passed, because of the great tragedy, we should realize that the writer has that duty to throw down everything which divides him with other people, that language shouldn't be a barrier, that he should try and strive through his language to speak to everybody and his ears should be open to the whole world. I think that's a, a very pleasant piece of literary propaganda. But unfortunately, the mere declaration of the dogma, art is universal, 
and we should take down the barriers is of very little significance really because art to be universal has to be particular. There is no good play set in Ambrosia. A play to be great, an idea to be great, has to be located and chained to a particular human circumstance. And the fact is that Jews are different from other people. And implied in your remark is the fact that there's a great universal spirit of art and all one has to do is climb up the ladder of art and one leaves one's heritage, one's genes, one's blood behind and joins the divine company of angelic interpreters. Very wrong. Very wrong. The Jew has a particular kind of vocation. It, wa it was his blood that apprehended a particular kind of divinity. It is that kind of apprehension that keeps the people alive. Without the exercise of that apprehension, he becomes nothing but a mere consumer of the world's goods. Question or comment from the group. This is Belkin. Whether the Jewish theme is being commercialized in American literature today? Uh, I would say that Jewish themes are not being commercialized, that what we think of Jewish themes are merely folk heroes. Now the point is that the, the market in America today, especially in the eastern seaboard, is a Jewish market. And that market, in many subtle ways, produces pressure on writers of inferior quality to produce sociological folk heroes. Now, we are going to see the advent of the same kind of folk hero in Negro literature very soon. The fact is that there's just going to be, the protagonist is just going to have a Negro background and he's going to do exactly the same thing as the Jewish heroes did in exactly the same way. But I don't think we, could, we should confuse that with Jewish themes. Because there are no writers in America today with except possibly Norman Mailer who is treating Jewish themes. That is the confrontation with the absolute. Ms. Wiseman would like to make a... Uh, I, I'd just like to say one more thing to Mr. Cohen, partly to uh, uh, clarify what I think is a misunderstanding. Uh, where I appreciate the, the, the Dionysian uh, strain in you, uh, uh, the, prophetic, uh, the prophetic aspect of the Jewish experience, I think I should say something also for the Apollonian aspect, which is equally historically, right back to way back when, valid in the Jewish experience. Also, I would like to protest against although I understand what you're getting at, to protest against the romanticization of people like junkies. If you've ever had much to do with them, they haven't had a quarter's fingernail worth of experience in the spiritual realm. Believe me, I've been there when they've been washed out, I've been there when they've been in and out, and they are not the proper people to stand for the kind of prophecy which you very rightly would like to see him. I'm Jews again. Uh, Ms. Wiseman, I don't intend to debate the advantages of the psychedelic experience with you. I can only say this, that I have had personal experience with almost all the drugs going. <laughs> and I know the narcotic situation very intimately in this country, the United States and the Middle East. And I can tell you that the, the addicts that you've seen are heroin addicts who are the victim of a particular mafia police conspiracy and that drugs are not confined to that particular kind of experience. And I would say that any Jew from a synagogue having an experience with mescaline or LSD, and I'm not, I'm not advising this, but in, in view of the morass, of the swamp, of the miasma, of the dampness of the Jewish spiritual state today, a state that nothing could ignite save through the scalpel or through the whip or through a drastic alteration of the senses through narcotics. And that's the only point I'm making. I do not, I, I do not suggest that everybody shoot themselves with junk. You don't have the veins for it, most of you. What I am suggesting what I am suggesting 
is that crucial life experience which is romantic, which is Dionysian and Apollonian together. Crucial life experience is not the dull, dead, totalitarian center. It's not the nice things. Crucial life experience is romantic. And the only point I'm making is that that does not flourish in the synagogues today. Yeah, but if you can't get close to God without taking a pill, I was not just talking about heroin addicts, as a matter of fact, taking a pill, chewing a cut or anything like that, man, you are spiritually pretty weak to start with. No. I'm Did you have a comment, sir? Yes. Uh, I have the impression that the whole question of tonight uh, may be beside the point. Uh, one element that has not been uh, brought about is the question of the tremendous rate of change in which we live. Uh, we've uh, gone, most of us, through a tremendous catastrophe. Jewish life nowadays is not the same as it was 50 years ago. It's not the same as it was in Poland 100 years ago in the Shtetl, and it's not the same as it was in our experience when we were young. I'm also an immigrant to this country. And I think most people, most Jews nowadays, refuse to be merely Jews. They consider themselves as human beings who are part of the greater community, be it their city, their country, or the whole humanity. And then when we talk of writers like Philip Roth or the others, who are honest in the sense that they portray Jews as they are, maybe not necessarily as they are, but as they see them. And every writer, I think, has the right to portray any personality as he sees them. That is the part of art. And I have the impression that the idea that Jews are, are a prophetic people, as Mr. Cohen has said, I, uh, I don't, uh, I leave, I want to leave him this impression if he likes it very much. But I just don't think that Jews nowadays are any more prophetic as any other people. No. No. Jews, <laughs> Jews recognize more and more that they have the same problems as all other people. They no, may they have don't. a different they history don't. and to a certain extent they are different. But the fact that they are different does not mean necessarily that they have to just enclose themselves in the ghettos as they do and not go out to the broader world. And that's why I agree with my wife that the universal values are those that are important to each one of us, even Jews or non-Jews. <laughs> But this is the dull, liberal, humanistic center. That everybody is the same, everybody's good, everybody's equal. The point is this, that peoples, races, bloods have vocations. That people have geniuses. If you don't believe it, then you wipe out the variety and the beauty of the world. Because, because, let me renew myself, as a poet said, let me renew myself in the midst of all the things of the world which cannot be connected. Do not connect things too easily. Do not connect with human intelligence. Do not make a huge broad sweep and include everything under the same wing. People are different. Minds are different. Minds and people soar into different directions. People have different destinies. Constellations await for different kinds of activities. And if you want to eliminate the variety of men, then you are a spokesman, not for humanity, not for equality, but for dead totalitarianism. Look, 4,000 years ago, the world was idolatrous, and a small eastern tribe repudiated the experience of the world to develop a difficult idea that has burnt a people for 4,000 years. That is what I mean by variety. Of course the world is idolatrous today. That's why the Jews have a particular vocation. That's why we're here tonight examining a special unspoken kind of anguish about our identity because we're not fulfilling it. There was a time when all Israel, when all Judah's neighbors were idolaters and some madman decided to smash the images and turn himself into light. Now that is the challenge for Jews in every generation, whether it's a ghetto or whether it's a metropolis, is whether they are burnt or whether they are citizens. Question there. Very simple English, Mr. Cole. Is my English insufficiently simple? <laughs> are you saying that the Jews have a special duty to save the world? The Jews have a special duty to save God in the world. Look, as I say before, 
if the apparatus in each of you who snickered just now, if the apparatus in each of you has so withered that you cannot apprehend holiness, the numinous, then you are indeed ripe for the humanistic society. Another question there? Yes. Look, my friend, there is such antagonism and hostility in your question that I am reminded of Emerson's remark, which I've forgotten. <laughs> Here it is. What you, what you are speaks so loudly, I cannot hear what you are saying. In other words, the reality of your question can never distract me from the words you use. You're not asking me about my relationships with the Jewish people. You're trying to censure my relationship with the Jewish people. Now, if you want to really know what I think about the Jewish people, I have three books and a forthcoming one in which you can examine my relationship with the Jewish people. If you think my relationship is antagonistic, I suggest you read closer. Uh, and I think that, for instance, Bertrand Russell and Eric from, although they do not come from synagogues and they do not come from churches, are great the prophets nowadays since they are concerned with the reality of living and that this idea of something that has to be transcendental, somewhere beyond, does not have to necessarily be what we look for is holy. And to that extent we may agree, although the terminology, the question of semantics... No, I, I disagree. I disagree. Basically, transcendentalism without God is sociology and politics. Well, you haven't given a definition yet of what, what this is, and I, and I don't think... Look, you're nourished on definitions, I'm nourished on the Almighty. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it's very hard. The, the question was, would I explore the differences that are innate in the Jew? And I, I couldn't do that while standing on one foot. Uh, it's a matter of the knowledge that each person in this room has. There is a time, you know, when we must start discarding definitions, start discarding the problem which we create for ourselves. We know what God means. We know what the word means. We don't need a definition. We know what the word Jew means. We don't need a definition. There comes a time when the definition only obscures the human reality. Now let us return to the human reality. We know how we feel in the world. Jews know how they feel in the world. All I ask is for some allegiance to that feeling. If other people feel the same way, I praise the variety of the universe. That's exactly what I wish for each person, for each race, for each blood, for each city, for each street, for each tree to feel different, so that the individuality, so that the the oneness of each thing can express itself and not obscure itself in this dead center of acceptance and definition and clarification. Let us refuse to clarify. Let us only follow the allegiance that we know we owe. I think it's only right that the panel should each have the last word, if he wishes. I would, I would like to thank the gentleman who so eloquently uh, accorded me my charm. I would like to say one thing. It is just that kind of cynicism. The kind of cynicism that says, ah yes, let them have their ideas, let them have their romance, let them have their dreams. We know the world is run by bankers and politicians and generals and statesmen. Because that cynicism eventually results in the idea of God becoming a charming idea. 
And that is precisely, I'm happy it was articulated at the end of this meeting, that is exactly where the Jewish people today, we hold God like a little bauble, like a little charm. And that's our special little identification mark that 4,000 years ago we had a special encounter. Well, let me endure and flourish in my naivety. I believe the world goes on strange and mysterious plans and that the statesmen and bankers and warriors and generals and IBM manipulators are charming. <laughs>